even if you're not a developer, you can still do it. If you have an idea and the, the WordPress plugin repository helps, you can create a minimal viable product, something that works. You can put it there and you will see if people are interested or not. My, my income comes uh, only from plugin sales. I have been a plugin developer for 12, almost 13 years now. And it all started a very in a very simple way. I was working in the company and... Hello everyone, my name is Maciej Nowak and welcome to the Awesome to Know podcast where we discuss all things WordPress. My today's guest is Carlos Moreira, an indie plugin developer and also WordCamp organizer. I was talking with Carlos about his path of developer and where it got most interesting for me was when Carlos was talking about how he sold his two plugins to investors. If you don't want to miss new episodes and keep learning about WordPress, subscribe to Awesome to Know newsletter at awesomestudio.com slash newsletter. This is awsomstudio.com slash newsletter. If you watch this on YouTube, give us a thumb and subscribe to the channel. This means a word to us. Without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Carlos Moreira. Hey everyone, it's good to have you here. We're glad you decided to tune in for this episode of the Awesome to Know podcast. Hello, Carlos. Thank you very much for joining the podcast. Thank you for inviting me, Mati. <laughs> Yeah, th- th- this is th- this is a great that you were uh, able to join. Um, we met uh, during one of the WordCamps. I think it was WordCamp Italy. Correct, um, in Milan, yes. Yes, exactly. Um, and, you know, I'm curious because we now, we, we met then, we met then uh, at WordCamp and now I hear you are uh, helping organize not one, but two WordCamps, correct? Uh, correct. So I'm... Uh helping with the WordCamp Europe, which is the big one in Europe. Uh, we expect around 3,000 people, and I'm in part of one of the teams. I've been volunteering in the past, and now I'm volunteering in the organizing team. And I'm also the lead developer for the local WordCamp in Porto. Uh, it's a smaller local WordCamp, but we expect around uh, 300 people. And it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun because I like this part of the community side of uh, WordPress. I think it's important to give back also by helping with these events. I really enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, gr- great to hear. And you no, know, I uh, I had recently recorded um, a podcast with organizers of uh, WordCamp Europe, but um, I would love to know more about you know why again because this is very interesting because you commit your own time and this is like question number one for me always. You know why? Why did you decide to spend your own time doing this? I think the community has always been part of my own journey as like an independent plugin developer. And it kind of grows on you. You start going to local meetups and you know those people, they become your friends. And then you want to take it to the last ne- next level. You go to WordCamps or like a bigger reunion and it's great for networking and learning. And then you find yourself wanting more and you go to a WordCamp Europe, then that means you're going to travel abroad. And and then you make friends, you learn a lot. A lot of my own uh, uh, my own uh, career has been influenced by the people I met, either by the conversation, finding out tools, finding out solutions. And I learned so much that I think this kind of events should keep on happening and I think they are important for WordPress Uh, so and it's part of like giving back to the project Uh, maybe I'm not giving back by solving bugs in the WordPress core but I'm helping I can help in the organizations of of these events and um, it's it's easy when you enjoy what you're doing so I enjoy the community side and uh, so it doesn't take uh, it's tiring time-consuming, but in the end of the day, you're, you feel good about yourself. Yes, it, it's like in this saying that if you find a job that is what you love, you don't have a job, right? You don't, you, you never work anymore, right? Correct. So f- for right now, it's uh, volunteer work, but uh, I mean, it's volunteering for something, for uh, like a bigger, I don't, don't want to say cause, but volunteering to this WordPress ecosystem that also gave a lot back to me and to others. 
All right. So uh, since we are talking about WordCamps, um, how is it going? You know, for WordCamp um, Porto and WordCamp Europe, and uh, I don't know leaks or interesting facts or you know challenges you face right now. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with the uh, WordCamp Europe, which is a big machine. Uh, there's a lot happening. It's a very big team. I'm on the volunteers team, so we are responsible for kind of recruiting volunteers to then help in the event and uh, so we hope to have around 200 250 uh, volunteers in the event wow so that's uh, almost 10 percent of the attendees or volunteers because it's such a big event we need volunteers in small tasks it's the number of people you a little bit less than what you're expecting in porto right so this is like yes a... Uh, it, it's an army, right? Army of people, it's, army of volunteers. It, Where yes, do you get uh, them? <laughs> yeah, so then the word goes out. WordCamp uh, needs volunteers. I was a volunteer in the past. I recommend it. It's a great experience also to meet people and you have a, a little bit of access to the like backstage of uh, uh, WordCamp, uh, so be, uh, as big as WordCamp Europe. And we, uh, we received hundreds of applications. We need to go through them uh, one by one to vet them to see if they are uh, real people and if they are not uh, breaking any rule or something in their social, just to make sure they are uh, good applicants. We vet them individually and then, yeah, we have, so it's a bit of a laborious task uh, uh, to go through that, uh, but it's important and uh, we are a good team. We're handling it. We need vol more volunteers. I don't know when the post podcast is going out, but hopefully if it's soon. Before June. Yeah. Let's hope before June. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. And so, and also that's on the WordCamp Europe. And I, I'm the lead organizer for WordCamp Porto. And uh, what I decided uh, to be a lead organizer, taking the foot on the footsteps of uh, other people that have been organizing for almost 10 years, World Camps in Portugal. And you know, uh, World Camp Europe was in Porto a couple of years ago. And they, it, so the, the team that was before, they started with meetups, World Camps, and until organizing World Camp Europe here. And so I'm kind of the, and some of them retired. They need a bit of after so much work. And I kind of came in. And I'm helping and as the lead volunteer of WordCamp Porto. And right now we are in the phase of uh, speaker submissions, uh, volunteer submissions, and a lot, of, most importantly, uh, sponsor submissions, because it's the sponsors uh, that help make the event possible. Um, we are all volunteers. Uh, we have kind of the support of like a WordPress community team, but uh, we need to make it happen with sponsors. Um, right now we are maybe 50%. The event will be in uh, May, 17 and 18 of May. Um, everyone is, that is listening is invited. And uh, right now we are maybe 50% into sponsors, what we need from sponsors. Um, we are uh, uh, getting the speaker submissions that we will start uh, reviewing uh, in, a two, in two weeks and volunteers and yeah it's a little bit of managing a big team which is also an experience something new for for me it's not so easy sometimes because we are humans we make mistakes but everyone is committed and uh, we hope the outcome is is great world camp and i recommend everyone to show up and uh, and come and learn something in porto also and then fly to italy a couple of weeks later <laughs> Exactly, yeah, for, 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 for the big one. Um, anything particularly challenging for uh, organizing um, WordCamp uh, in Portugal? So I think uh, one of the main things or the most addicts, they come from uh, catering and the venue. If someone's listening to this and they want to organize WordCamps, if you get these two things, everything else is very smooth uh, because catering for... Uh, it's like a wedding in the, in the end because it's 300 people. It's, and then we have uh, uh, dietary restrictions. Uh, uh, and then uh, today in the world, it, the, the, it's very volatile. I mean, things are changing with wars and suppliers and prices change. And when we're handling uh, 
suppliers, which is the venue and the catering and, and prices are not fixed. We don't know how much we're going to spend. So that's one of the challenges. Um, when that is solved, uh, if you have a good team, it should be it should be smooth. I have a great team, uh, but since we are all volunteers, none of us is getting paid to organize this. Sometimes it's, it's hard to find time where everyone is available. Um, find the level of commitment that we would uh, like. Uh, it's different levels. Each one, maybe one person has half an hour a day, the other one has one hour a day or one hour a week. So it's trying to put organize everything uh, together. Uh, so that's uh, a challenge also. Uh, sometimes uh, if the organizing team, they know to each other for many years, it will be easier. Uh, in our case in Porto, there was a team that there was a much smaller team that they were organizing for many years. But now this year, we're trying to include new fresh blood, new organizers, and we are a, a larger team, but unexperienced. So this is only my second experience organizing a WordCamp. Last year, I was just helping in a smaller role. Um, so there's a lot of inexperience in our team, but everyone is committed to make the best WordCamp possible. Perfect. Great. All right. Um, good luck with the organization and in Thank your you. fundraising. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious how, how will it um, how will it go? Um, and changing gears a little bit, you mentioned you are a um, plugin developer. Can you tell me a little bit how did how did all you know start uh, for you? You know what's your history with plugin development? There are so many plugins out there for WordPress, and I mean, you know you are one of the contributors to this huge uh, <laughs> plugin database. I'm very curious, you know how how it started, how is it going, and you know what's in the future for you. Uh, yeah, uh, so I, I develop, my, my income comes uh, only from plugin sales. I have been a plugin developer for 12, almost 13 years now. And it all started a very in a very simple way. I was working in a company and they needed something the, for a WordPress site. And uh, I, I, I built it. It was a maps, uh, map kind of visualization thing. And uh, there was none, there was no plugin in the market to do that. I did that for the company. It's fine. It was done. And then when I left the company, I remember, okay, but there is, uh, I learned how to do that. I, there was no plugin. I'm going to try to see if it, I did, I developed a solution for that particular case, but then I wanted, Maybe this is can have a, a broader reach. So when I was outside of the company, I built um, a, a new plugin based on what I learned, and uh, it went very well. Uh, after three or four months, I was able to just focus on that. But also, it's important to say that 13, 12 years ago, the WordPress ecosystem was very, very different. It was easy for us to develop a product and easily. Uh, sell it because there were not many solutions in the market. Uh, there was less competition. But anyway, that's how my career, let's say, kick started. After that uh, plugin, I developed a few more, and uh, it's been like that ever since. Um, I always worked alone. I come from a, a design background. I was not. A, I'm not a, like a engineer, so I had trouble even programming, but WordPress is, is is more or less easy. And there's a lot of documentation. There's a lot of examples online. So I was able to find all the solution, make everything work, learning how to code better by each time. And uh, I built uh, three or four plugins in the first phase, let's say, of my career. And uh, those plugins were doing good. And then there's like the second phase of uh, my career, which it coincides to when I started attending meetups and getting more involved in the community and the WordPress ecosystem itself was changing. Doing a product was not enough or doing a product that was just premium was not enough. And I saw that using a, the freemium model was much better as the, the ecosystem was changing. And 
I knew from other plugin developers, uh, developers their experience with this model. So I decided my new plugins would follow this model. And uh, so let's say five years ago, I started this second batch of uh, plugins using this model. And uh, it's, been, it's been doing great. I did, I'm gonna tell a story of one plugin I did by chance. I was helping a friend uh, doing um, a website. I usually don't do websites. I was doing for my friend and they needed something very simple, which was a contact form in DV that one of the fields was a date picker to select the date. And there was nothing for DV builder. And I thought oh, I can do this in a couple of hours. I took a JavaScript library, uh, loaded into a, a plugin that would convert that specific field into a date picker. And from that, I thought, okay, I'll do this uh, as a, a plugin also. I did it. So something I did in two hours, I put it in the re repo as a free plugin. Uh, it started getting a lot of feedback. I published a, a, a blog article explaining how to, to use it. I was getting a lot of feedback, a lot of feature requests. And, and I thought, okay, this has, it's such a simple concept, but it has potential. And putting it on the repository meant it, it brought it more attention. It, uh, the support requests and feedback also helped me know where the plugin should go. And I thought, okay, I need to have a, a paid version so it's uh, sustainable. I did, and uh, a few months after, it was doing not so much money, but some. And uh, But since I had other projects to focus, uh, okay, I think I prefer to give this to someone else. I, I put it for sale in a plugin business platform, and uh, there were people interested, and, and I sold. So that was like my first, it was a very small project, but it was my first like payout uh, thing. Yeah, that's, and, that's, very that's very interesting that you have created something, then it grew a little bit, and then you, you thought, okay, I, I don't need this, but hey, it turned out that, you know, you can sell everything, and nearly everything. And there was a customer that wanted to buy something you wanted to dump, right? Because you didn't want to do, you didn't want to, you know, continue with this project, right? Yes, uh, correct. And that's, part of uh, maybe my profile that I prefer to stay like in the early stages of the plugin product development and when it grows uh, more and it maybe needs more marketing maybe SEO uh, to to have bigger sales I'm not very comfortable with that I, I, I don't have much interest in that, that part so this experience was was good but also there's the dark side of the, this experience that happened, which the person that bought it, it was a different mindset. They were outsourcing support, outsourcing development. And I saw that then the ratings of the plugin started going down um, because their attention to the product was not uh, as much as I was giving. Um, I like, you know, to give support. It's like one-on-one, answer fast, detailed. And then I think it's one of the dangers when we sell the plugin to someone else is if they are going to keep this uh, this thing. And uh, it, it, it wasn't the case initially. I think now it's a little bit better. Um, so that's one of the bad sides. Mm -hmm. If I may interrupt, I'm thinking about totally different models, like totally different business models you and the sell and, and the buyer had, because you are, let's say, in the creative, on, on the creative part, you are on a mission to fix a problem you had when, when building that, that part of the website for your friend. And then you had a very close um, relationship with your customers. And this was dragging you. I mean, this was this was the problematic part. It was eating too much of your time. Now the buyer was thinking about not making it all easier for the for the users, but rather making profit on that investment for for the seller for the buyer. It was an investment. So 
to justify the spend and to you know get, uh, have a return on, on the investment, they had to change something. What was troubling you, they have outsourced uh, to you know somewhere, and you know the quality dropped of of the customer care. Yeah, so this is I, this is also something uh, people are saying when there is a great SaaS platform, it got uh, it, it gets sold, and then you know the support deteriorates for example so there is there there is that inflection point when the business got get sold and this is when you as the customer has to pay more attention if everything is going as good as it was before mm-hmm. yes i think uh, I, I mean from the buyer perspective like if someone is buying the plugin i mean the user um sometimes they see oh it's a company behind this i'm sure they are good and sometimes it's not the case because they are also outsourcing support, etc. Sometimes they say they see, oh, it's it has the name of the developer. Oh, this is just one guy. Maybe it's not worth to spend the money here. Maybe this guy disappears. But sometimes it's 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 better because you will get one-on-one support with the plugin author. Um, that a, a lot of the independent plugin developers like myself they actually enjoy the support. I, I was enjoying. I enjoy giving support and having this direct relationship with the client. And sometimes they would be even surprised. Oh, I'm talking to the pl- person who developed this. This is uh, so good. And good support gives you good uh, ratings, and it's all related. It's all related. I could give, be giving support when I was traveling in the in a camper, and. But if I write good support messages, they think I'm in the office uh, or with a tie, you know. Yeah, and it, it all boils down to the quality of the support, not you know the location. And now there's the the third phase of uh, my career, let's say, is that I redevelop a new Maps plugin based on one that I did ten years ago. I made it more modern. And this was just before the pandemic, and uh, uh, I launched the pro version in January 2020, so two months before. Uh, but uh, actually, it kickstarted my the plugin because it was Maps, and during COVID time, a lot of people were using Maps to show infection rates, so. This coincidence actually helped the plugin have, have more installs. It it also grew a lot, uh, and uh, a few months ago I also decided to put it for sale because it was too much. Uh, I already had a friend helping me, but um, I think the plugin grew so much it was it would be better in the hands of a bigger company that maybe they were having a marketing team, a SEO team. Uh, person dedicated to support and developers and uh, I did I'm right now I'm in the middle of a transition I sold this much bigger uh, plugin and uh, I'm working with a new team to like uh, teach them all the the things about the plugin and the support team and it's it's going very well and now I'm entering again the phase of I need a new product to repeat the cycle. Uh, now I'm working with a friend, uh, which we, he's an engineer. So together we hope to develop new products to go to the cycle through the cycle again of uh, yeah. So we are making the like plugin a, grow. There, there are so many labels uh, like to name you. Uh, like there is um, indie hacker, solopreneur, because this is you know this is one man a one man business. Um, what else can I uh, can I think of? Um, sole Serena developer. developer so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how do you feel about all of those labels? You know, because I I have a feeling they all apply, and you know, have you ever uh, thought about it? There, I think they're all positive uh, labels. <laughs> I could also we can also add like some like community manager because of my work with the community. Uh, I think it's okay, and I think it's a good. Uh, I mean, the lifestyle. I am I am a family man. I I only work uh, like maybe four hours a day. I like to pick up my school my kids from school early. Um, so this 
this uh, work situation allows me to have a more relaxed, let's say, um, lifestyle that I want to keep. I think if I grew a company, if I would keep the, all these products, I would need to grow a company and it would be mean less time, more stress, I don't know, and more th having to do more things that maybe I wouldn't like. Um, so all those labels are good. Uh, I'd, I didn't reach the CEO label or those more uh, financial roles that I can, I, I don't need them. It's, they envy the freedom and, you know, the amount of free time you have. <laughs> so, uh, you know. I mean, it, uh, because family also takes time and uh, a lot of stuff take time. And I think it's important for also your own mental health to feel good and have free time. And Fine, let's unpack uh, those yeah elements you have mentioned right now. So let's talk about selling the, the plugin, but also, you know, with, with, with the sale, there's a price to, you know, to come up with, uh, you know, for my, how much I'm happy to sell my product. And then uh, I would love to talk about, you know, the whole starting the, the whole cycle again, right? So let's let, Tell us, how do you go about selling your plugin? So it it was initiated, as I understand, by you, right? So you put the the plugin on sale um, on a platform, correct? Correct. So right right now in the digital world, even WordPress world, there are some platforms where you can put your product for sale, your your business for sale. So it's relatively easy to to do that, and I learned a lot from the first sale. Uh, to be pre more prepared for this bigger second sale. Uh, the buyers, so, okay, so first, why the site to sell is, I talked a little bit, it's when it, it grows to a point that you either create a company, you hire more people, or you give it to some company. And that's what happens. Um, and then the seller, the, the buyer, sorry, they're going to come with questions. And some of this, I'm not... Um, but I was not very informed or maybe this financial side I was not worrying uh, like I was not worrying about how many visits the, the site was having how many uh, conversions were on the cart uh, and all these numbers I was not worried at all about this uh, but yeah, buyers... and you were sorry, sorry for interrupting but you were not worried about them meaning you are confident in, in these numbers that they are good number there's good number of visits good number of downloads this yeah I mean I was focusing on support and I see that the sales were coming so I didn't even look at the other date, data and that's I think why maybe other people like to look at the data and they know where to grow um, and they're going to ask, well, what's your churn rate? What's your this and that? And for the first sale, wow, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, that was a piece of education, <laughs> right? <laughs> when yes. you have to produce that numbers and you don't know what to produce. For the second uh, part for the plugin, okay, I, I have my own spreadsheet where I would put some numbers, not much, but just to give an idea um, of the growth. And uh, so when the second sale were coming i had a lot of offers uh, but i wanted to reach a specific uh, threshold a specific number like mental i would only sell for this amount i had a lot of offers that were two times the last 12 months of income so these are numbers i wanted to sell for 2.5 the last 12 months of profit and uh, that's the number I got for this uh, last sale. And, uh, but there's an, a lot of variables. Are the, is the profit from subscribers or one-time payments, uh, like lifetime licenses? And I see now there's a debate about uh, lifetime and subscription right now. And maybe I can talk a little bit about that also. Uh, me coming from a map plugin background, my experience was people would buy a plugin, set up the map, have maybe one or two questions in the beginning, and then the map is there. So I think in this scenario, and for plugins that are have this profile of 
you in, yeah, there's an initial setup and then they leave it. I think the lifetime makes sense. If there are plugins that are continuously giving value to your website, either by integrating with posts or some other API or helping with sales, then a subscription makes more sense. I, I did have both subscription and lifetime. And in uh, this big plugin, the profits were half. Half were from subscriptions and half were from lifetime. And this sometimes was worrying the, the buyers because, you know, lifetime doesn't mean it's going to keep these numbers. But from my 10 year experience for this type of plugin, lifetime uh, makes sense. And so, um, can, can I kick in with a question? So, if in your opinion, one time payments were made sense, so why so many people, like 50% of other people, you know, of your customers were choosing to subscribe instead of to, instead to pay once? I think it's the price difference. Uh, so the yearly subscription was uh, one third of uh, the lifetime. So lifetime was three times yearly. Uh, maybe they don't have confidence if the project is going to last one, two, three years. And uh, maybe that's because of that. Maybe it was just because the way the checkout process was because by default is, you know, the yearly subscription. We tried a little bit of focus on the yearly subscription. Maybe it was that. I don't know. I, I, it's like stuff that I don't, uh, I didn't A-B test to see these things. But I want to dig into this. <laughs> I want to <laughs> ask more questions about this. So yeah, I, I don't have the answer why that's 50-50. But uh, I also think by experience, uh, a lot of the websites, they don't last uh, more than three years. So having the lifetime on my side, on our side, made sense to... And the lifetime also caters for those needs, for those like agencies that they want to build the product and... Uh, give it to the client without any subscription and and stuff. And whoever has kind of an ongoing project, they don't know if it's going to work out or not, they go for the yearly subscriptions because they know that they can cancel anytime. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about that checkout process <clears throat> that um, the yearly subscription was the, uh, sorry, not uh, one time payment was, was the default option that I'm I'm thinking about optimizing for something. So it could be optimizing for uh, like um, current revenue mm, because this would give you what the customer would pay in three years time upfront, right? So you build a lot of, uh, let's say, upfront um, revenue initially. On the other hand, if you optimize for the... Um, sale of the company of the plugin more recurring revenue is more desired because this uh, is multiplied then by 2.5 for example uh, 2.5 um so yeah this is this is curious you know about you know uh, thinking about those numbers you know how is it going you know what's the churn rate you know let's optimize uh, the um um the checkout process uh, have you been also thinking about pricing in terms of you know what can be done about pricing how uh, did you change prices during the lifetime of the product uh, not too much uh, those are i did some tweaks those are the areas that um, i i don't care so much let's say i i think i did my initial study to price the product and i i found a good balance and it was working so i didn't touch i at some point, I changed it slightly, uh, the lifetime, uh, by a but small difference. And uh, I juggled a little bit with the euro and USD uh, prices because the, the, there's some fluctuation. Uh, but I didn't experiment a lot, um, just simply because I was focusing on other things. And this business side of like optimizing, and, and I wasn't so focused or worried about and that's where you can ask help from uh, other agencies you had the uh, james baldacchino here uh, talking about um, marketing and solutions and he works for a company that does this kind of like optimizing the analyze and that's uh, when you're it, it's not what developers are 
uh, focused on. And um, so, yeah, I didn't get to the part of experiment and uh, uh, I hope that the new owner probably will and there's space to to improve that. But what picking up on what you said, it's true. If you want to make money, lifetime makes you quick money. If you want to sell, it's more interesting to focus on the year, this, getting more subscriptions because the, the potential buyer will like those numbers more. But then I think the balance between two, because if it's only subscriptions, the revenue is less on the short term. Uh, so you might get paid less. Also, uh, yeah, it's a little bit depends on the profile of the buyer also. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's get back to the uh, to the investor. You know, you mentioned that you were you were aiming at a uh, two point five valuation, and that you were worried about that split. You know, that even split between lifetime and and recurring. So how this history develops? How does how was the history? You know, was the base for the whole revenue or only for from calculated from that um, recurring revenue? So. Uh, we when uh, a buyer comes and uh, in this case it was a lot of money so they want to go through everything to make sure and i think it's a a calculated risk uh, knowing that half uh, of this revenue comes from lifetime Uh, but then we we discussed i showed like historically how these things were and from my own experience uh, with other plugins that were lifetime only in the past that this kind of plugin works with lifetime and the industry, although there's a, a big shift, everyone is defending subscriptions. I still think there's a place for lifetime and uh, it's a matter of, you know, making your case to the buyer that it makes sense and uh, them under- looking at the numbers and understanding them. But ultimately they're looking at uh, also at the, uh, other fine numbers like the number of subscript uh, the number of buyers if they're if they're rising uh, how many sus- subscribers are dropping uh, they look at everything so putting all of those things together and uh, I don't know if I can make some more advertising I'm using a platform called uh, freemius to sell my products and they do. They take a small percentage of the sale, but we have a dashboard with uh, churn rates, uh, subscriptions, and all this. There's a whole dashboard with a lot of graphics that I really don't care, but they are there, and this was also very helpful for um, the buyer. Um, so and and they look into everything. You know, in this case, the buyer. It was a like a. a family business let's call it like one of the brothers were more into finance the other was with marketing and so all of them looked into the different perspectives of, of the business and and it, it worked out we managed to find a, a good um, balance between what i was hoping and what they could offer and right now we're transitioning and i'm also at the same time working on a new product <laughs> Great, great. This is this is a great story, you know, with that you know cycle uh, repeating itself. I wonder how did you come up at two point five? You know, because this is a number that you know our listeners um, may wonder about why this particular number and why not seven? Why not I don't know twenty yeah. or whatever? Yeah, I wish it was five, for example. <laughs> or, yeah, <laughs> that's just not that. Uh, I think uh, three. I think it's. I mean, if it was all subscribers, no lifetime. I think three, maybe even four, you can aim for those numbers because they are subscribers. When there's the lifetime in the game, I think it lowers a little bit. Uh, I still think uh, looking at others, talking a little bit with other product uh, owners, maybe some of them, they they got four times, but they were only subscriptions. Others less because they were only lifetime. And 2.5, actually, it it, it isn't that great because you think, why sell something that in... I can keep doing what I'm doing and in two two, two and a half years, I'm going to get this money anyway. But it's... Yeah, why you decide to sell also enters into the equation. Um, 
And in the end, 2.5 seemed uh, like a reasonable num number considering um, all the factors. Uh, I don't know what's the standard. I mean, I talked with some people and uh, some they, oh, 2.5, that was great. That was a, a great uh, business. It was good, uh, a good rate. Uh, others say, why, why so little? Um, I think uh, I mean when I also had the experience of the first people that were interested everyone was aiming at two two times uh, uh, annual profit and I was seeing okay so this is what the real value let's say if there's like four people that are experienced in the industry offering this of knowing that they maybe offer something lower uh, it means that the real value is around two uh, two times and uh, so 2.5 was the extra step to make me sell right when i'm thinking about this and you said that there is 50 50 split it means that you got multiple of five for that part that was recurring revenue and that was very good result you know you know mm -hmm. obviously the, the new buyer would would have the income from one-time sales which were 50 percent so it's um it's like mudding the picture a little bit, but you know, if for some companies you only can um, you can only account for the recurring, excluding all of the one-offs. So you know, one-time payments they are not exactly one-offs, but the, the 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 revenues happening only once, and then there is that license forever. So can can you tell me a little bit more of what you are planning right now? How will you come up with a new idea? What is the creative process for creating a new idea for a new plugin? So it's now 12 years that I'm uh, doing this. Um, the idea sometimes is uh, recycling old ideas, old projects that worked, they just need to be modernized. And also I it's also 12 years that I'm working in the like maps ecosystem. So, uh, although I do have like a non-competing clause because of the sale, uh, there are some exceptions and I will still develop uh, plugins that are related to maps. Uh, maps is a niche and it's, but it's a very big niche depending on the map solution you, you, uh, you create. There's a lot of competitors also in this niche, but I think it's great and it's things that evolve with time. So one solution, from app related stuff from five years, maybe it's a little bit outdated now. So I will keep on the maps ecosystem and I have some other ideas like to explore WooCommerce uh, solutions in that market also. Uh, but for people who are starting, uh, what I can say is the most common way to have an idea is you're developing something for a client and there is no solution for that in the market. So you come across an opportunity. Okay, so that's a bit less likely to happen now than 10 years ago, but it can still happen. Another way to get ideas for a product is integrating with something new. Like uh, imagine now there's uh, OpenAI, integrating WordPress with OpenAI. So I have a, sorry for interrupting, but I have a feeling everyone is doing, you know, everyone, every agency that has a bench uh, or, or, you know, people without projects is doing this right now, very, very heavily investing. There is, it's a huge bet. Everyone is doing it. Thinking about the huge payout uh, if there is, um, if, if the idea catches. Yeah, it's true because uh, from time to time, there's, there are these opportunities to create products that uh, if, if you're successful, you can get uh, big money or big implementation for example some years ago the gdpr uh, rules uh, uh, the people that started doing plugins to integrate this with wordpress early on were the winners because now that if we see the like cookie law or gdpr whatever plugins they have thousands of installations i i said uh, open ai now but for sure there will be some new software product integration that that will create opportunities uh, for for developers to to create but right now it's true it's a, a rush uh, when there's such opportunity for such a big market there's a lot of 
investment to see if there's a big payout. And so it's a bit of a, if you're an agency and you have the resources, it's okay for an independent developer. Mm. Uh, but still, there are other cases. Another example of uh, imagine that uh, I, I'm going to use the example of OpenAI, but something as they release an official WordPress plugin, but it's a bit, uh, it's not good enough. You can always develop your own plugin. And it might be better than the official one. There are a lot of stories in the WordPress ecosystem of independent developers creating better plugins than, than the official ones from the companies. Um, uh, Mail, MailChimp and you know similar services uh, or payment gateways. or There's always also opportunities to improve, even if the official company has their their plugin and who knows maybe they will buy you a, they they will buy your product to integrate as their own um, so there's a few ways that the idea can come to you and um, it's more difficult now than in the past but it's an ever evolving and changing ecosystem and uh, technology uh, might uh, might change i think there's a lot of opportunities in uh, 3d um, a little bit in augmented reality, um, but uh, right now, how to use this inside WordPress is not very clear, or there's not a big market, but it might change. Um, the same when Gutenberg came out, the block editor, a lot of block libraries came out, and some are still very popular. Uh, um, but yeah, I think getting back to the basics if you need to develop something that doesn't exist there's your opportunity mm -hmm. i love it i love it and i'm also thinking you now if anyone listening to our conversation would like to follow your path um do you have any words of wisdom to that uh to that young adept of, of <laughs> <laughs> solo developer in the hacking <laughs> don't be afraid to uh, explore even if you're not a developer, you can still do it. I think it's worth to, if you have an idea and the, the WordPress plugin repository helps, you can create a minimal viable product, something that works. You can put it there and you will see if people are interested or not. I know right now it's difficult to get attention in thousands of plugins, but if it's um, something valuable, it might take one year or something, but if you develop something that uh, is helpful, users will come. So if you have an idea, develop it, develop a minimal viable product, put it on the free market, use the feedback from users, the initial users to improve and see if, to validate your idea, to see if it's worth to continue to pursue that idea or not. And uh, get involved in the community because you will learn a lot from others. Um, and uh, and try uh, try one time it doesn't go try the second time i'm not saying everyone will be successful uh, it's uh, nowadays difficult to have a successful plugin but uh, even if you have an idea you see that there's already a plugin for that check that plugin maybe you can do better because there's opportunity to to improve on the, on something that already exists um that's what I would say to young WordPress indie hackers. Uh, it's possible. There are tools. The market is big and very competitive, but uh, there's always going to be the need for new products and solutions. Great. Um, I I have I think one last question. How would you compare you now your path with um, building products as plugins versus, for example? Uh, building, I don't know, ready-made templates to be bought on Envato, for example. Any takes on that and differences, similarities? Uh, so in the early days, I would say they were very similar. I also sold in uh, in Envato my first plugins, and I still have them there. I still maintain them. Um, and developing a plugin in a theme, maybe the theme would require more design skills, but in the end, it was PHP code and um, templates and uh, uh, 
CSS. Uh, so similar to a plugin in a way in the technical aspect, but without the plugins wouldn't require maybe so much design. Uh, so in the early days was similar. And then it started shifting apart a lot um, because also in the early days in Envato, in ThemeForest, the theme already came with all the features coded in without even without using plugins. It was like you need a WordPress site for a booking platform, just install this theme. Everything is kind of built into the theme, the booking system. And But that was kind of a not the idea of WordPress. The idea was to separate design and functionality. Um, and now the, the, the theme para paradigm changed completely. Um, and the themes were also kind of fashion, not fashion, like tendencies. So there was a tendency for flat design many years ago the teams that were implementing this design. So the themes had like a, a peak of sales and then they would drop unless, and then Sorry, there because were... they are so, so reliant on the current, uh, let's say design trends because they are so design oriented. Also, and, and then uh, the multi-purpose uh, teams showed up like Divi, Avada, and these mega teams that they could do everything. So uh, then the, this specific themes, they started dropping and this DV, Avada and others started growing. While with the plugins, it was always the same because we're providing functionality. So that was a little bit of the difference in the, the, the themes market. I think that the themes market were more competitive. You would get money, a lot of money faster, but then you would need to think of a, another project always kind of, um, unless you would develop a mega plugin, a mega team. And with plugins, the functionality was still required. And yeah, and then the page builders came and they dominated the market. And before that, the sliders plugins were dominating, the, the making a lot of money. So there's a little bit of uh, uh, tr trends also in the plugins industry. Uh, but the new block editor also kind of destroyed the need for a lot of this uh, small... Uh, utility plugins and um, yeah it's an ever evolving um, market and for now if you want to be a theme a theme developer it's a bit strange I, I'm a bit outside of this right now but I think you don't develop a theme anymore almost you kind of develop a temp, uh, like the patterns and and you offer the patterns as as a theme so the the paradigm changed so much in the way theme developers were doing things in the past and right now. And, uh, and with the plugin developers, it's a little bit different. Things have changed, but uh, not so much as in the theme world, I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, earlier you mentioned that there is that battle between um, proponents of one-time payment versus subscriptions. Subscriptions are defending it themselves. Recently, um, there was a new product uh, launched, totally built from scratch, meant for um, one-time payment, and it's called you know it's it's once and it's it's coming from uh, Jason Fried and uh, Thirty Seven Signals. So it's a Slack replacement you can run on premise on your own server for uh, the the the. Um, the promise is five dollar, you know, hosting environment for ten thousand users uh, concurrent. So this is peanuts, and this is three hundred dollars for you know once uh, you pay once, and you know this is crazy that you can de develop nearly one hundred percent Slack re replacement and have it for three hundred dollars and run it for five dollars a month. So this is mind blowing. Yeah, I think. It is. I didn't know this uh, project, but it's there is space for the lifetime, uh, and uh, at least when you start an idea, it could also help your business. You need more money fast, and maybe then after some time you change you change your strategy. Uh, so th there's a, a lot to discuss in this topic, and uh, it depends on you know, the product. Uh, maybe it's a single use product that you only need to run once. So why is it a subscription? Um, 
And maybe, so it, you mentioned they are offering the hosting. Maybe that's the, the recurring that they, they will get, no? Maybe you so one time advanced payment for something, but then, and then a residual smaller payment, but that's the long term uh, gains. Yeah, the hosting yeah. you can you can you can choose you know so they uh, they true. sell you it's only true. the so, so software package mm -hmm. and this is this is crazy yeah but I, pre I appreciate the take um and carlos thank you very much for uh for joining the pod i really like the conversation especially about you know the pricing the the product this was super interesting and i think unique because this is uh, i know no one wants to talk about numbers and you know what were the you know tiny details of the transaction you know so i really appreciate your openness here and and this was very interesting conversation for me thank you thank you for inviting me cheers thank you see you see you see you in italy uh, hope to see you in portugal you're invited also i'm still i'm still thinking about this <laughs> all right take care carlos if you like what you've just heard, don't forget to subscribe for more episodes. On the other hand, if you've got a question we haven't answered yet, feel free to reach out to us directly. Just go to awesomestudio.com forward slash contact. Thanks for listening and see you in the next episode of the Awesome to Know podcast.